Our series examines the childhood of the common folks and athletes. People who are like muddy oaks and perhaps no has a stash of our guests today, Bob Williams. We'll be hearing about his childhood, but first let me tell you in a nutshell or a part about his accomplishments. He's a decorated veteran of World War II, the founder of WRFC and other radio stations, a co founder of two banks. The Athens Daily News and Georgia Opera Advertising. Is this mic okay? No. It's a little loud. Um, he was a modest 
studious gentleman. She was personable and hardworking. Why don't you share with us what it's like to have fried chicken for breakfast? And um, tell us, paint the picture of your parents in those early days. Well, I can do that in a few moments, but I wanted to share a couple of uh, items with you about the year I was born in Tifton, Georgia, 1922. My mother and father, my mother was from Commerce, Georgia. She was Mary Nix. And many of you remember her brother, Abby Nix, who was an attorney here in Athens for a number of years. My father was from Maysville, Georgia. And after his service in World War I, he and his brother went to Tifton, Georgia to begin a wholesale grocery business. And in those days, there were no supermarkets as we know them today. Uh, Mom and Pop neighborhood grocery stores served the needs of the community. And they uh, were able to develop quite a substantial of business uh, throughout South Georgia. And as I prepared for this occasion today, I went back through some of the memorabilia that I was able to retrieve from my mother and father's homes after their passing. Unfortunately, the cover to this book, this little book is divided by Ivory Soap. Many of you probably still use Ivory Soap. And I want to read you the first page of this book. The rest of it, of course, is tips for young parents about how best to raise a child. And of course, uh, made that child in Ivory Soul. <laughs> Being an advertising guy, I think it was very appropriate that my mother began my life with using the first page of this Ivory Soul book. <laughs> And here's what's in it. Claude Williams, the first day, November the 5th, 1922, weighed seven and three quarter pounds. I mean, uh, no, seven and three quarter inches. Weight nine pounds. And our last two grandbabies were eight pounds and uh, less. And uh, his first spoken word in seven months, and uh, didn't bring my reading lesson, but uh, he first walked September the 10th, 1923. So I don't know, Madam, you could probably tell us the others, all the mothers in the room, but I soon you spoke to walk, but apparently it took me a year to be able to walk crawling around on the ground. And, uh, my first, first spoken word was mom. And if any of you would like to see this, I'll let the ladies pass this around and you can share it in the audience as we can. But I want to sort of set the stage by where I was born. Uh, the statistics. Uh, Absolutely. While we were in Tifton, Georgia. Yes. And then we'll get to the problem that ensued later. And right. if, if you don't ask me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Um, I found it very interesting, I mean, certainly we can talk about the migration to commerce and the basis behind that, but, yeah, yeah. yes, but I did want to, um, thank you so much for sharing the nature of your parents. Your father was a biblical scholar and a lay minister, and, um, a wholesaler as well. He loved the rural churches, um, and hungered for an opportunity for a high school education. Perhaps you can speak to that. My father was born, as I indicated earlier, in Maysville, Georgia, which was in Banks County. Many of you know where it is. It's about seven miles north of Commerce on the Southern Railroad between Athens and Lula, Georgia. And, uh, they did not have a high school. There was no high school in Bank County at that time. And my father wanted to get an education beyond the great school that they had in Maysville. And uh, as I was preparing for this occasion today, I had gone through 
some of them memorabilia and I didn't want to bring too many things for people to look at, but one of the things I found was my father's graduation certificate from Chattahoochee High School. It's a school that has not existed since the 70s, but it was part of the Hall County school system, and my grandfather and grandmother arranged for my father to live with the Miller family in Claremont, Georgia. That's where the Chattahoochee High School was located. And he was able there to get a, a high school education and has always been a, uh, a student, right. both biblical and otherwise. Right. Um, and, you know, as you were making the distinction between your mother and father and the gifts that they, you know, offered the, the household, your mother had an open door policy and, um, you know, a, a welcoming arms nature. And that was reflected in, um, certainly in her family's taking you all under wing at that time, if you wanted to speak to that. Well, well my mother's family was from Apple Valley, Georgia. Any of you familiar with the, this section of North Georgia? It's halfway between Jefferson and Commerce. And back when I was growing up, the U.S. highways were the only highways, generally speaking, that were paved. When I was in high school, the highway between Athens, between Gainesville and Jefferson, where I, I grew up uh, after the fourth grade, we moved to Gainesville. And uh, it was not paved. So the highway 441, instead of going up the railroad track from Athens to Commerce, it went to Jefferson, to Commerce, and then to Clarksville, Georgia, because it went to the county seat, whether that was the shortest route or not. And one of the interesting things about my mother and father's family, uh, they moved from Apple Valley in 1900 to Commerce. My grandfather was a farmer, and merchant, and he and his half brother owned a general merchandise store, Davis Ditch Company in Commerce. In those days, he sold everything. Uh, and he operated a big farm on the back to the middle of Pony Road, more like a creek there, but it was a uh, hundred acres or more of what we call bottom land, very good land to raise cotton in those days. Uh, mother's Father, obviously, was a successful businessman and farmer. Uh, he was one of the organizers of the First National Bank of Commerce. Uh, he was mayor of Commerce for a number of terms, served a number of terms in the state city, representing this particular area. And his home in Commerce in 1900 was built by my grandfather Williams, who was a builder carpenter. In those days, you had a lead carpenter, generally speaking, and he recruited the other technicians needed to build a house. And so my mother's home in Congress was built by my grandfather. They did not leave until 18 years later, which is an extremely interesting, uh, interesting but my mother was quite an boy. My father, was, she would be considered an extrovert. My father might be considered an introvert because of his bookish nature. But they both contributed a great deal to my sister and I developed both the children and the adults. Um, and I know you talk about how your your father particularly would like to visit churches, all churches. You know, and take these opportunities, particularly rural ones. Um, one, one reference I was making regarding that move to commerce was related to um, the, the wholesalers' risk and the sugar depression. Yeah. And fathers. I mentioned that wholesale grocery business that they began after my father and his younger brother left military service in uh, World War One. And uh, they went to Tipton, Georgia, as I indicated earlier. 
on that cold field grocery business. And when the 29 stock market crash came, most of the neighborhood stores that they sold groceries to, practically all of them, the business was done on the credit. And the same was true uh, most of their retail customers. When my wife and I moved to Athens, married in 1947, we did business with Malcolm Garrett Grocery Store. And they were one of three grocery stores in Athens that delivered. And you phone, place your order, they would deliver it to your home and send you a bill once a month. And when we later built our home on Timothy Road in Athens, we traded in Hamilton Grocery. And some of you may remember Hamilton Grocery. Had a wonderful meat market out at the corner of Lincoln Highway and the Timothy Road at that time. And one of the interesting things, we had a, a lady that worked for us and did the cooking and, the, and ordered the groceries for us. And my wife was teaching at the university at that time. And uh, of course I was busy with my business career. And this lady did not have any ingredients when she called you on the telephone. She began immediately with the purpose of her call. She didn't say hello, good morning, how's the weather, it's rained all day, and nothing. She just began her conversation. And we laughed all of her conversations to Hamilton's grocery would begin with what her grocery list was. That's them. Bring me two boxes of this and pound of ground beef. And that's the way she. Uh, that's the way she did that. But you asked about our moving, I believe, to the commerce and what happened in Tiffany. The 29 crash came, and these people couldn't pay. As I indicated earlier, the merchants say so too. And the best example that I've used for years, and my wife said that I can't talk without using my hand. <laughs> and if you've noticed by that, I try not to other than my wish. Well, I'm getting warmed up now, so I'll be using more hands. And most ministers do that anyway. They're good speaker. Now I'm prepared to be a good speaker. But the best example I know of what happened to a lot of merchants in, in that time, uh, after the stock market crash in 29, uh, they bought sugar by the car load, and freight car load. And it would take a couple of weeks to reach the, to go from the refinery in Illinois to Tiffany. It would be billed when it left the refinery. And my father tells this story, this cartload of sugar was, the price dropped $5,000 on one cartload of sugar in the two weeks and a few days that it took to leave the refinery and get to Tiffany. And some in the audience were smiling, which I expect to think that. Some similar experiences, if not the end of that, all of us had at some time in our life. And so at that, at that time, my father, of course, and his brother had to decide what to do. Uh, they were advised, even in those days, as people are now, declare bankruptcy. That's the best way to do it. My father said no. Well, we can't do that. And I have to live with myself. I have to look at myself in the mirror every morning when I shave and dress. And if I'm fortunate enough, I and my brother agree, his brother agree, we will repay every dollar we owe. And he was fortunate to live a long life. He never made a lot of money, but he repaid it the debt that they incurred after the building business closed. When it did, we had to move somewhere. At times were hard for everybody. Anybody that knows the history of the Depression, the best way to describe it is the recession and depression we've had since is there have been money around. Some people had money. But so I'm told in those days that very few people had money. I kind of trust him, started trusting Ford in 1919, and he was a true businessman, and I was talking to his daughter Kitty early this afternoon, and uh, I learned a great deal from Kyle and Trustle. And he was one of the people, and his business, the Trustle Ford in Athens, was 
able to move through the Depression and, and World War II and all the other recessions and depressions that came on until he sold a bit. But we moved back to Commerce, Georgia. My mother's family had a large home. They had servants. Uh, most of the children were gone. Uh, and uh, we were able to move in and live with them. I went to grades one, two, and three in Tiffin. And we went to Commerce in 1931. Moved back to Commerce for one year. As it turned out, we didn't know how long it would be when we moved there. <coughs> and what I want to share with you is a kind of a dog-eared book that we found in my mother's uh, belongings. And this is the Tabue, T-R-A-B-U-E, dash Stevens. And I know we've got some school teachers here. Spell it. And then underneath that is primary. And this is my book that I've written in it. Scratched all over the, the opening pages. Claude Williams, 4A, Commerce, Georgia. And this was the 1931-32 year. And if you, I think some of them might find this, find this in It's a, Speller School book that I got from fourth grade in uh, Commerce, Georgia, man. I bet you were a straight A student. Um, when you moved to Commerce and lived with your, your mother's family, what an incredible lesson regarding how, how important it is that we recognize we're all in this together. Um, well, at that age, it was kind of difficult to do. But most of us remember, I think the thing that we remember as children, certainly 10 years of age and under, or, and that's the case with me, is that I don't have a strong personal recollection of those events. And what I know is what my mother and father or others have told me about. And I overlooked one thing going back to Tifton, Georgia, and rather than refer to my uh, my father's strong religious beliefs, as well as my mother. But my father was a lay minister, and uh, as he liked to describe it, he never had the call to full-time Christian service. But he loved the small country church. We were a member of the First Baptist Church, Tifton, and there were a lot of rural churches, many of you from South Georgia, places like Willie Coochie, Ty Ty, Doe Run, and I could go on and on. Very unusual, small South Georgia name. My father loved these ministers of the churches, some of them part time churches, and whenever the minister needed to be away, my father would go uh, preach for him. And my mother was very active, had a younger sister, four years younger than myself, and uh, she was always busy and had heard most of my father's sermons and it didn't, didn't go. He would take me and I would sit on the front pew and take some of my toys with me to play with. <laughs> and one of those toys that I still have is uh, an A model, I mean a T model four. And this goes back to the 20s. <laughs> if you like to pass this around, let anybody take a look at it and want to. That's never been altered to my to my knowledge. Uh, it's the first one I've ever seen of. The thing I like to say about that experience, and one of the reasons I'm sharing it with you, is I've discussed this with most of the, my minister friends and the ministers of the First Baptist Church, where Charlotte and I belong. And my family had a 200 plus year Baptist history in this area. I need to tell you this too. Uh, my father's family was from Madison County, which most of you know, just north of Clark and Ed. And about uh, 15 miles from where we're seated in Madison County, there's a family cemetery. There's 64 people buried in that cemetery, none since 1900. My father looked after it, rescued it from the trees, and one of the interesting things, 
story that he told about it when I had the letter is he wanted to put a wall, a small wall around the cemetery. It was about a half acre cemetery. An acre, as many of you may or may not know, I think is 210 by 210 feet. So this is about 100 feet square. And I helped him with this because uh, I was in the business here in Athens back in the 50s when uh, he did it. And he, uh, early 50s, and he uh, put a concrete block wall, three quarters of a concrete block around it. And in order to pay for it, he wrote most of his cousins a letter, of which I still have a copy. And in this letter, he tells what I have just told you. We need to rescue this cemetery from being overgrown in the future. And I'm clearing it and having a three quarters Concrete wall put around the cemetery will last till Gabriel blows his horn. <laughs> In the early 90s, tree roots began to <laughs> crack that wall. And unfortunately, it didn't last till Gabriel blew his horn. But at that point, I said, My father and family have put so much into this cemetery. My great great grandfather is very dad. He and his family came from North Carolina and he was born on a family farm there in 1797. And he and his wife were buried in this cemetery. Uh, my great great grandfather and his wife were buried there, along with 62 other family members. And there are only five grave sites now that are marked that you can read. The deceased name and dates were chiseled in on what they call soapstone, just native rock. And those that faded away in the early 50s when my father did this, I took photographs. And so both of my great great grandparents and their family I have photographs of their soapstone markers with the rough, and you can tell, read what they were. But I didn't, and I knew they were going to eventually fade out. And they all but two now are so faded that you would not know who was buried there. So I had uh, uh, granny markers put with their name and birthday and death date on those. For my two great grandparents, great great grandparents, and great grandparents. And then my father had a list of the, of the men and women and children. Some of the children, and you could tell that by they had the markers like this. And then, of course, my adults, they had it six feet apart. And uh, he had a list of the people who, the 64 people who were buried there. And, uh, so I thought that it would not be good to have that record and so I had one of the uh, grant companies over to Elton do a grant marker and we put out in front of the, the cemetery and I had a black, uh, uh, nice black fence put around the cemetery and have a grant marker out in front of all 64 names. And I have my name on there on my father that I restored and just have Claude Williams Jr. at the Georgia. And I'll bet you since that was done in the mid-90s, I've probably had a dozen or more phone calls from people who thanked me for doing that because we have been doing genealogy work. And we're trying to go to the grave of some of our ancestors and relatives and uh, the only way we knew for sure that they were buried here the names listed on that grand mark because you couldn't find their individual grave. And that instinct, you know, to remember in perpetuity is, is just so much uh, a part of the importance of family as well. You know, when we were talking, actually, Pat Priest and I were together with you that day, it was just one of the loveliest mornings I've had in some time. Actually, there had been a pretty heavy rain that morning. And we were going to be in five points of Jittery Joe's. And I called Claude and said, oh, 
talk to you. You never invite him to your house. Huh? I don't mind just come and we'll do. And <laughs> the interview here, he very graciously put Charlotte on the phone and made our arrangements. Um, as we concluded our, our hour with you, you know, we were talking about what it is that is so crucial for the human spirit to move forward. And, you know, obviously family and um, faith. Um, and, and two areas that I'd love to touch on, they may not be specifically related to your acorn phase, um, but our fortitude and philanthropy. Which one should I begin with? <laughs> Let's start with fortitude. <laughs> You know, as I had the pleasure of, of meeting Claude, I guess probably 35 years ago, I was getting a midlife crisis broadcast journalism degree and made your acquaintance and was just, you know, I've been mesmerized ever since. But this exercise has given me um, a golden opportunity to really have an in-depth sense of you. Loved your comment about hooray for hell. Would you like to speak to what that represents from the point of view of the depth that optimism needs to play in anyone's life. If I might just digress a moment because it applies to what I'm about to say. My life has been very cognizant over a number of years now. Uh, loss of her hearing and I have gone with her to Inimical audiologists, uh, and they always say, Well, don't you want to be checked? And I said, Well, I don't mind being checked, but I'm not the primary <laughs> client here today. And they would tell me what my percentage loss is. I've never gotten a hearing aid, I have a loss of some hearing, and depends on what all the audience go to and how long it's been, and how much I have in this year and how much I have in this year. But to get to the point of it is, the guys I played golf with for years, most of whom did just what my wife did. They went to every audiologist, everybody they could go to, to get their hair checked. And I have one man passed away recently and spent thousands of dollars. He bought the best here in age. That was his nature. He wants the best of everything. And he bought the best here in age. Didn't make any difference what he thought. And he couldn't hear it all. He complained all the time. <laughs> so that experience, that, and that's the excuse I give my wife when she said, you did too stubborn. And if you want, boy, get a hearing aid. Well, I tried several, and any of you that have them, you have to take them out at night, you got to take them out, take a shower, you got to <laughs> take them, change the batteries. Uh, and then the, the thing that turned me off to all of them, and the lady that I've told this to several, all the others, and we're getting way off the subject, but and if any of you, Say stop, just hold up your hand. Stop. Stop. <laughs> let's, let's go back. All right, man. I went, I went over, but I want to finish. I want to finish this my thought about this. About this. Yes. Is I went to Phil Sheffield. Many of you know Phil Sheffield, and they had. And he said, I told him this story briefly. And he said, I even know the front man here. Man. Still practicing. And he said, We got a. Audiology clinic right here. Come on back here with check out. They did, and they gave me the report before I left. And I said, "Do you want? What do you recommend, Phil?" He said, "I don't ever recommend anything to my patient. <laughs> you have to decide what you want." <laughs> Forty-two. So my decision is, I don't have a hearing aid, and I hear most of everything I need to. But the ladies' voices or at a tune and so forth that are difficult for me to hear. And so some of the questions yes. I'm having trouble hearing. And, and when we speak one-on-one -on -one sitting here, yes. you know, we had our meeting with Pat. I heard everything you all were saying, and, and that kind of, um, uh, 
come in. And so I did. And we came in and got in his living room. And the next thing we heard was a big tree blown over the, on the porch of the house. And she said, we better go to the basement. So we all went to the basement. And uh, the storm was over in a matter of minutes. There were over 200 people killed in this storm. Approximately 2,500 people injured. And it ranks in the top five tornadoes in the United States. And the game of time, and I just happened to find some of these in my file and just let them pass around. Now back in 86, they did the 50th anniversary. And they said 50th anniversary with a lot of pictures of the tornado. And then he might pass this or somebody wanted to. And then back two years ago, they did the 75th anniversary of the tornado. And then one thing I want to tell you about this, and Matt had mentioned my military service. The two things that happened to me in my life, which I have to look back on and, and wonder about, and I'll give you a, a brief, what my brief explanation of my surviving those experiences are. In 1936, as I described, we would have been on the street walking into the teeth of that tornado. One of my classmates was never seen again. He was seen by a businessman in the downtown area. The tornado hit 8.26 a.m. High school began at 9 o'clock. Uh, and a lot of the stores did not open until 9 o'clock. Man, seven. But a lot of merchants came early. And this young man was seen by quite a number of merchants as he walked along the street. Uh, never seen again. Rufus McMahon. Was his name. His body was never found. My friend and I could have been just that way had we walked as we normally did. If he'd been ready, we would have been on the square in Gainesville. If you look at these pictures, you'll see pictures of what the square of downtown Gainesville looked like. If you were outdoors in that tornado, your chance of survival was slim and none. And we didn't know what a tornado was. We would have we might have tried to run once it, we heard the wind, but I don't think we could have gotten the shelter. And then the other experience that I had, I can't explain that other than the good Lord must have had other things for me to do over my lifetime. In World War II, I was an infantryman in, in, in Europe. And I got there about the last six months of the war. Uh, from all practical purposes, the war was over at that time. Uh, if you look back out in history, but we were getting people injured, killed in every day. And we were moving from, from the C3 line, which the French had built between France and Germany, once we breached that. We were moving every day uh, in trucks until we were fighting them. And we'd get out and move into the town. And we'd have to clear the town. I was walking down the street on one side of the street. And a fellow lieutenant walking on the other side of the street and a sniper from the church steeple killed him across a narrow German small village street. I don't remember how I happened to be on that side of the street and he on the other side. But those two incidents that I know in World War II, my mother and father prayed more than once a day for my sake as well as that of love. And I like to tell people, I'm convinced that that's one of the reasons that I was able to come back safely for my brief experiences in combat in World War II. A prayer of my mother in law. Absolutely. Lord well, God. you know, it's unimaginable, both of those. I'm so sorry. Be crying. My heart. Carry one of the little trucks. Truck. I say I'm not alive. Excuse me. You know, all of us have, all of us have peacetime memories that are profound, that certainly.
make us feel extraordinarily fortunate. And, but we don't have these. We don't have storms. We don't have wars necessarily. So I applaud you. Um, this might be a great time for the Q and A phase of the okay, hour. I know there's some people who cherish you, and um, one one lady in particular said, "I wish my dad were here." Uh, the question answered. Okay. Uh, Let's see. If, does this microphone work? Yeah. Can't That's hear. great news. Okay, Claude actually. Claude can't hear. Yes. Yes. Do we'll you we'll repeat the questions. Okay. Will that we'll, we'll repeat yeah, the questions? Good. Okay. Questions from the audience. I'll start. Well, come on, come Sir, back. Got one how, did, we'll get, how did you manage to take care of that little car for <laughs> 80 some years? My family has been demolished in about three days. They just built better than in the car. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I can say. Good, good answer. I, I'd like to have all those uh, mementos back if you <laughs> still look at them. And just want to get them before they go. I know this crowd can be trusted, but we'll find out. <laughs> You tell the story about the race relations with your grandfather and the big blacks who worked with him at your home in uh, Maine. Did you, Did you hear that, Claude? Remember in your childhood, the, the post-Civil post War era, the, the relations between your family at, at, at the plantation, the equanimity between the the whites and the blacks who work side by side at kitchen table. My uh, personal experience uh, was in commerce the year I lived with my grandfather and then of course we made frequent trips to visit them both when I was young under 10 living in Tifton. I need to tell you one quick story about that. My mother would travel back and forth between Tifton and Commerce by train from the Southern Railroad to Atlanta, through Gainesville on the Southern, and at Lula, Georgia, they had the fur line down there. And so he got off at Lula, and she could come home to Commerce by train. We went in the diner after leaving Tifton one evening and uh, was enjoying the dinner. First, my first trip on the train, first experience in the diner, and those of you that have been on the old-fashioned trains remember they had the linen tablecloths, heavy silver. The silverware train, you know, it, it wouldn't fall off the table. And I don't know whether it was silver, but it was heavy. In any event, uh, my mother said, how are you enjoying dinner? And I said, mother, don't you wish the neighbors could see us now? <laughs> But, but specific to the, the, all of the people who worked the farm. Well, to get back to the question. My grandfather had a, a family that worked for him. The women, the husband and wife, along with the daughter, they, I don't remember how many children they had, quite a number of boys and girls. Uh, my, father, my grandfather provided housing for them. Uh, they used the same doctor that the family did. Uh, my grandfather ate breakfast every morning with Will and uh, in the kitchen, not in the dining room where they had the rest of their meal. But they would have breakfast in the kitchen and discuss the day's activities at the farm. And then they would go to the farm with the men with the farm and the ladies worked at the house in the, in the black family. And so I grew up around families that I knew they did things for us, but as far as I was concerned, they were no different than Partners. my sister and I. And that's always been our philosophy. I think we need to have great respect for all God's children. Absolutely. And regardless of that color, or background, social standing, whatever. And that's the philosophy that my wife and I and my family instilled in me. Treat everybody like you'd like to be treated. Right. It shows. Thanks so much. I think we have time for maybe one more question. And, and before we take that question, um, I want to let you know that when we're done here, uh, we invite you to go to the dining hall. Um, uh,
feature of this series is that we serve our special guest's favorite childhood snack. And Mr. Williams' favorite childhood snack is sugar, uh, sugar cookies. So um, that was part of my job to let me know that. You have a question? Uh, th this is kind of a big question, but he took us through. He took us through high school, I believe, in Gainesville, and then kind of left us there. <laughs> how did you get? How did he get to Athens and and all of the endeavors that he had here, of which I know there are many, many that we haven't heard about. Can you relay that? Man? Yeah, so, so life after your high school diploma, um, you're moving to the North Georgia uh, for military college, and then on to the university for for two degrees. The question was, what, what happened after high school? Just a synopsis of your education and perhaps real business. Well, I went from Gainesville High School, graduated in 1940, and went to North Georgia College, which was a military school, two-year military college, which I still have great respect for. It was two of the most informative years of my life. One from an academic standpoint, I was not a very good student in high school. I liked to play all sports, but not very good at any of them. And uh, when I got to North Georgia, it was run strictly by, by the numbers. We got up at the time they said, we went to bed at the time we studied. And so I learned discipline, I learned how to, to uh, do the things that you need to succeed in life. And I treasure those uh, years at North Georgia College. I came over to the university, uh, graduated from the university, and went into the military service, went to Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, and over to Europe. And uh, that's been my, my educational experience. After the war, I came back, and L.H. Christian and I were uh, started WRFC, 960 The Ref. Radio went on the air May the 1st, 1948. And uh, so that's sort of what happened to me. May I, as the interviewer, take the liberty of the last question? Yes. Um, this is reminding me, thank you for your question. When you, you returned, um, to America from World War II, there was a shipping strike yeah. in progress. And there was a family out of Tifton that your parents knew. He, the, the gentleman was the, the first pilot um, for Air Force One. It was Army Air Corps One. And so Claude made every effort to um, hitch a ride home on the plane because it would make a great story. But would you share with them what happened instead? Did I answer your question? I yes, thank so. you. Thank you. Well, I, I got it. Thank you. Well, that was an interesting experience. Uh, when it was first total first home in World War II, and it was a point system, and I did not have enough points to return to the States immediately. And so I was put in the Army of Occupation. Very fortunate. Had a wonderful job at Special Service Officer for Headquarters Command, and I stayed a year after the war. In July uh, 1946, I got orders back to the United States, but a shipping strike had begun. There were no ships to bring us home. My orders were to go to La Havre, France, and so we were just waiting there along with uh, hundreds of others. And we would go back and forth to Paris on the train from La Havre to Paris to have us something to do. And uh, Paris was much more interesting than the heart. And uh, we'd read the, the New York edition, I mean the, the European edition of the New York Herald Tribune, which was the English language newspaper in Europe, to see what was happening. Well, I picked up one of those papers the day Marilyn was talking about and saw that Secretary of State Jimmy Burns was bringing a peace delegation to a conference in Paris and he was coming over on the president, President Roosevelt's plane, the sacred cow. And I knew that uh, who, a man I'd never met, Colonel Henry Meyer, whose mother and father owned the Mine Hotel, M-Y-O-N, Mine Hotel in Tiffany. And uh, he had written a book, I think, I don't know whether I had enough 
opportunity to show it to you or not, but it turned out that he was the first presidential prime uh, pilot. He flew a lot of, he flew Senator Russell all over the world. Uh, Roosevelt, as many of you know, was a, was a Navy man, and he didn't like, but particularly like flying, and he went to a lot of his conferences uh, by ship. But I went to the American Embassy and I saw this notice and said, I, I know Colonel Myers and I'd like to get in touch with him. And when I did, he said, we're already filled up. We're going back to the States and I have service men, but I have a full load and I'm sorry. I can't take it. So I missed getting on the President's plane to return to the United States. And a unique thing happened, and I didn't know this until I read Colonel Myers, the book written after his death, put together by his son, a big uh, coffee table style book. And in that book, it said the plane was hit over Newfoundland by lightning and had to land, make an emergency landing in Newfoundland. This is the first oh, plane, plane in which I might have been on board, but no one that was injured and it got back, uh, it got back safe. But the, the point that I wanted to make was, or I hope you can make is, so you, you crossed by, by sea passage, and when you pulled into the New York Harbor. Well, coming back from uh, 18 months overseas uh, during World War II, and sailing in the New York Harbor and seeing the Statue of Liberty was the thrill of a lifetime. I can tell you that. And then I got home about a week later, had to come back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. They gave me a plane ticket, I mean a, a railroad ticket, back to Gainesville and a discharge from the Army. And I still have the honorable discharge, thank you. Thank you so much. Claude Williams and Adam Van